how to read and so even if I did skip a slide that we'd be able to fill in the blanks especially with all of our lecture okay we've talked about the uh, there's integer data types there's floating point data types as far as the computer is concerned as far as the language is concerned they're very very different beasts especially how they're stored inside the computer Integers are just stored as a straight series of bits, you know, in the same system that I believe I've talked about. Whereas floating points are actually stored as two numbers. One is the mantissa, and then one is the exponent. So, a float should be 32 digits long, where 24 of them are the mantissa, the number before the, you know, the power of 10, or actually power of 2, it's, you know, stored inside it, but anyways. So like 3.14 times 10 to the power of 7, the 3.14 is the mantissa, and the 7 is the exponent, except inside, of course, it's binary. And so you can see that the double gives us a lot more space, because it's a 64-bit number in most operating systems, most hardware. And a lot more of them are dedicated to the mantissa, but also the exponent can be much larger. So numerical constants. If you want to specify what kind of data your constant is, you can suffix it with a letter that indicates what type it is. L for long, for long int. UL for unsigned long. And quite often, it'll do the conversion for you. You know, if you, whoops, a little bit dark. You know, if you try to store an unsigned long, or a long into an unsigned long, it'll go ahead and try to do it. But if you know the number's going into an unsigned long, you may as well be very specific about it so that you absolutely know that there's no odd rounding or overflow occurring. So without any suffix, a number is stored as an int, or if it's got a decimal point, it's stored as a double. You would think that float would be the default type. I don't know when this changed, but this is the way that Java and C++, excuse me, and C Sharp work as well. So that if there's a decimal point, it's an automatic double. I would just forget using floats and use doubles all the way through with, uh, with that in mind. If it's got an exponent in it, it's treated as a double. But if you suffix it with an F, it's a mere float. No commas, better not put any spaces in them, better not put any dollar signs on them, and apparently no fractional exponents. I guess that makes sense. I've never thought about why you would do that. You can certainly use a POW, a power of function, to raise something to a fractional exponent, I believe, but not just as a native number that you're entering in because it's not supposed to be trying to do math as it does this in there as these things are being stored in the variables. So those are numerical constants also known as literals. You can have character and string constants and then ignore the fact that it's uh, you know using the, the wrong kind of quotes. It's just that's Microsoft Office being helpful to me. So single letter constants, character constants, constants of type chair or char character have single quotes around them whereas strings have double quotes around them that's different than python where they were all the same whether you put a single you know quote around it or a double quote around it python is the weird is the oddball in that the rest of the languages you'll, you're likely to learn here do that distinction single letters mean a single excuse me single quotes mean a single letter a single character a single character can be an escape sequence because that's still a single character underneath it all. A new line is a char is an ASCII value of 0a, which is, you know, a 10, a byte of 10. A slash t is a tab. You know, backslash, backslash is a backslash. That's a double quote, right? And then there's a single quote. I don't see it there, but I know it's there. Character constants can also be written by their ASCII code by prefixing it with a slash 0. Slash 0, 060 means you could look up the decimal value of 60. Notice it says uh, 60 there and it says 48 there. That would be the, the hexadecimal version of it. I don't know why they said that. 
So if we go to ASCIItable.com and we look up character number 60, make absolutely sure we know what we're doing there. Ask, come on, come on. ASCIItable.com. If we look up decimal 60, okay. If we look up hex 60, What is it telling us? <clears throat> well, lost that. Sixty forty eight is a zero, or so it says. We go here. A zero is a forty eight decimal. Where did it get sixty from? The Are we saying? Pardon me. The octal. You think it's the octal value? Yeah. Powers of one. Powers of eight. Six times eight is. All right, I'll buy it. Not liking that. Forty-eight. Not going to worry about it. Just know that you can specify a character constant in terms of its ASCII value. If you want to figure out how to do it, go ahead and Google it up and figure it out. Check the book again. So a sequence of characters in close and double quotes is a string, string constant, string literal. There's one, there's one, there's one. Now this looks like a number, but it's not. It's enclosed in strings. You know. Quote three is dramatically different than the numeric value of three. So these are not characters, but they're considered arrays of characters. This is an array that is actually six elements long. Zero, one, two, three, four, and then there's a fifth element which we can't see, which is the null character tacked on at the end. So this has six characters in it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six in that array, considering the null as a single character. So naming a variable, valid names can't be a keyword, can't have spaces in them. They are case sensitive. Variables are identified by the only the first 32 characters. So if you give a variable name that's longer than 32 characters, you can put anything you want to after that. Are you going to make variable names that long? Probably not. There are a couple conventions. Libraries commonly use variable names beginning with underscore. You can use uppercase style and underscore style. That's underscore style. The other way that people tend to do it is with camel case, where you use uh, uppercase letters in the middle of it to, to differentiate it. Whichever you want is up to you. Underscores are older school, old school. I like the way they look. I also think that they're easier to type for students because people will mix up their uppercase and their lowercase, so my examples tend to use more, more underscores than anything else. So when you declare your variable, you give it a type, you give it a name, and it's not a bad idea to go ahead and initialize it right on the spot. You don't have to. Later on, you can give it a value. But if you try to access it without having given it a value, it's a bad thing. It can have garbage in it. 
All right, so global variables. Global variables are variables that are defined outside of the scope of main or any of your functions. And they're considered tacky, but they're also terribly useful. So for example, here's pi. We don't want to define pi inside main because then our other functions may need it as well. <clears throat> I'd be tempted to define pi as being a pound sign, you know, define. Pound sign define pi 3.14159. Then I could put it in caps and it'd be all pretty. Of course, you could put this in caps too. This is a constant, so I would define it as a const. Const space float space pi. Now, just because you stick const in there doesn't make the data safer. It just means that any other programmer working along with you knows, or the compiler will catch it if the source code tries to change it. And then down here, we actually use pi. So if you have a global variable defined, you can actually access it from other .c files in the same project, which is an interesting idea. Because it's out of scope of this function, it's out of scope of all functions in all the .c files. Remind me, I think you use the extern keyword to reference a global keyword that's uh, in another file. We'll see that soon enough. So the lifetime of the global variable is the entire execution period of the program. As soon as the program is loaded into memory, even before main is executed, this has already got a value. And it can be changed by any function in here, as long as it's not const. They're seductively easy to use. You can use that to pass data around from one function to another. Right? You don't have to pass data in as an, a parameter or a pointer or you know, anything like that if it's just a global variable. But again, that's considered tacky. Local variables are the ones that are defined inside the function. So the radius is defined within the function. It's only available within that function. Sure, you can pass it somewhere else. You can pass it to another function. But its lifetime is this function. It disappears once we hit the close function. So if we had this inside some uh, subroutine, you know, some other function, int foo, you know, and inside here we declare a variable int x. We're not going to be able to get a hold of x inside of main. Yes, foo could return it and then we would be able to get its copy, but otherwise that function, that variable is local to this function. It is within scope only between those two braces. So the lifetime of a local variable is while that function is escaping or is processing, being run, the entire execution period of the function which it is defined, but only after it's defined, right? Yeah, I couldn't access x here before I defined it. Can't be accessed from any other function. In general, variables declared inside a block are accessible only in that block. And what if you do funky things like declare a variable in one function and then return a pointer to it and then try to change it? Uh, from outside of it. I'm actually just kind of curious about that. We're going to use GCC today. Sigwin. Okay, so if I do CD caps, oh, um, dollar sign caps home, it should take me to my home directory. So if I was elsewhere, you know, if I'd uh, maneuvered somewhere else, and I wanted to get back there, I could do CD dollar sign home. I could also just do CD tilde, and it would take me there. If you have more than one user, nah, I'm not going to even talk about that. We had the question of how do you, you can use a single dot as an alias or the way to specify the current directory. And that's not important. I mean, that's important not when you're just executing code, right? Because we saw that if you want to, want to run your exe, you have to use dot, you know, slash followed by the file name. But in your program, if you're trying to access a file in your current directory, or you want to get a, a file listing of the current directory, you don't have to specify a directory path, a fully qualified path. A dot would get you the current one. And you may know, you may not know that double dots mean go up a level. So my current path is that, but if I do cd dot dot, and then I do pwd, 
it shows that I'm in users. And then if I do cd dot dot pwd again, it shows that I'm just in sig drive c. cd dot dot pwd print working directory. And now I'm in sig drive. cd dot dot. Now I'm at root. cd dot dot further shouldn't even let me go anywhere else. You can always get to root just by doing cd backslash two. I want to get back to my home directory, so I'm going to do cd tilde pwd. That takes me back to where I am. Can I call notepad from here? Yeah, I can. Okay. I'm just doing a little experiment. I'm going to define a function which returns a pointer to an int. So I'm going to declare my variable, and then I'm going to return a pointer. Return the address of foo. No, I'm not going to use the same variable name as the function name. That'd be dumb. OK, and so I'm just going to call this june18.c and hope that it doesn't put, I'm going to change it to all files so that it doesn't say June file 18.c.txt by accident. All right, so I'm going to define a pointer. This is a, P, a pointer to an int, so I'm going to call it pi. pi is equal to p foo, parentheses in parentheses. Now I'm going to change its value. Star pi is equal to 10, and now I'm going to print out star pi. So printf value equals percent d backslash n end quote comma star pi. Just to see what happens. All right, and since I ran notepad from the command prompt, from the sigwin command prompt, I can't actually compile it without either launching a new copy of SIGWIN, which I guess I could do. I'm going to close that SIGWIN. Processes are running. No, I don't want to do that. All righty. I'm just going to close Notepad, and I'll come back, and I'll open it later in something better like TextPad. So anyways, ls star.c, I should see my Well then, where did it save it? All right, guys, remind me. We just did this Wednesday. Where's my home directory on these machines? Pardon me? Yeah, okay. Not in documents. Yeah, okay. Yay. So GCC June18.c minus O June18.exe. No, PI is an undeclared first use of this function. Did you mean? Okay, obviously I've made a goof. My goof is mixing up PI and lowercase PI. I should have just made it lowercase pi through the entire thing. See what happens when I start mixing up a case and lowercase. All right, try it again. Invalid type, argument of unary star. I'm going to get, oh, and I forgot to declare 
pi as a pointer. I was being sloppy and I thought I didn't. I put p in front of it, but I forgot to put the asterisk in it. Okay, now it is a pointer to an int. I had to change that line. Once more with feeling. Function returns the address of a local variable. It is warning me. Why is it warning me? Because that variable only exists between these two places. What happens if I run it anyways? I wonder how badly it's going to blow up or if it is. Dot slash June18.exe. Segmentation fault. Core dump. We could find the core dump and inspect it and find out some useful information about that. So pretty much don't try to access data that you declared in a function. That doesn't mean you can't allocate memory and then return a pointer to that memory. That is totally safe. But you can't use what's called an auto variable, an automatic variable or a local variable. So if I really wanted to, OK, this was a failed experiment. Bad code, right? Bad code. I'm going to comment all this stuff out because it was bad code. Bad code can't use a pointer to a local variable from another function. Trying to subtly or not so subtly introduce the idea of pointers as we go along, even though we haven't talked about them in the book by far. Just want you to, to see them in use. And it'll help if I don't make mistakes like forgetting to define my pointers as pointers. And we've already talked about what it means. This is not an integer itself. It's a pointer to, an inter, to a, the address that this or some integer is declared at. So arithmetic operators, this is pretty boring. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus, which means remainder. You need to keep track of the fact that integer division and floating point division are treated as two different things. Here's what integer division looks like, right? Int x comma y x is equal to 3, y is equal to 4, and then int z is equal to x divided by y, or if we were just going to print it out, what is x divided by y? Well, it's not 3.25, or, or it's not 0 0.75. Since they're both ints, we have our operator there. We have two operands. Since they're both since both operands are ints, it will round the answer down to, to another int. And so 3 divided by 4, not 0 0.75, it gets rounded down to a 0. So that's integer division. You Python folks knew it as divide by, divide by. There is no floor division operator within this language. Its behavior just differs based on whether you have two integers or you have mixed types. If one or both of them is a float, it doesn't do integer division. So if you did this, you know, float f is equal to 3.0 divided by 4, then that really is 0 0.75 because one of them is a floating point number, so it doesn't default to doing integer division. It actually works. It works the way we would expect. And if you've taken Java or C++, you probably are already familiar with the idea of integer division being different than floating point division. But for you who came to here from Python directly, you just need to be aware of that. Why? Because what if you had an equation like this? The volume of a pyramid is 4 thirds, if it's a perfect square at the bottom, right, 4 thirds 
times the base squared or the width squared times the height. That's the equation. Now we don't have a square function, so I'm just going to write it width times width times height. So that's the volume of a pyramid. But what is this going to evaluate to? 4 divided by 3. They're both ends. So it's not going to be 1.333. What's it going to evaluate to? It's just going to evaluate to 1. Right, because 4 is larger than 3, but yeah. So that would be 1. It will completely change the meaning of the function. Yeah, if it was 3 fourths, it would evaluate to 0. You know. So that volume calculation would be completely incorrect. You could fix it just by making one of those a floating point number. Or better yet, why not make both of them a floating point number? Just be careful when you're transcribing mathematical formulas and they have ratios in them like that to make sure that it doesn't mess you up that C is treating the integer division or treating int operands to give you integer division. So I'm just going to copy and paste that line. That's a good way to do it. This is the bad way to do it. That's bad. And why is that bad? Because 4 divided by 3 rounds down to 1. So percent sign means modulus. If you do 4 divided by 3 like this, that's equal to 1. If you do 4 percent 3, 4 modulus 3, that's also equal to 1. Why? Because when we did 4 divided by 3, it resulted in 1, but it also had a remainder of 1. 5 modulus 3, excuse me, 5 divided by 3 is still 1, right? But 5 modulus 3, if I could find the percent key, I'd be doing good. Well, what's that equal to? When we did 5 divided by 3 and we got 1, what was our remainder? 2, Two right. OK. And so 6 divided by 3 is equal to, that one's easy, 2. And so 6 modulus 3, when we did 6 into 3, it went evenly. So what's our remainder? Zero. Zero. Right, right, right. If you want to check to see if something is even, mod it by 2 and see if you get a remainder. If x percent 2, that's even. If you want to see if something is evenly divisible by 10, if x percent 10. Now why am I not, okay, I think I made a goof there. You ought to do that if x percent 2 is equal to 0, and I'll explain why, and if x percent 10 is equal to 0. The way C works is that if the expression inside the parentheses is non-zero, it counts it as true. If the expression inside of the parentheses is equal to zero, then it treats the if expression as false. So if I hadn't put that there, x percent 2, 2 modulus 2 is in fact zero, so it would treat this as false. I was trying to be clever and not put that on there, but that was a bad idea. In general, your expressions, if they evaluate to zero, it's a false. And non-zero means true. That's why I don't think it's a bad idea to go ahead and use some pound sign defines to define, you know, caps true and caps false as being one and zero. And then just using Boolean values like that. But the language doesn't include them, so we may as well get used to not having So here we go. If number percent 2 is 0, equal equals 0, print if it's an even number, else print that it's odd. This language doesn't let you do it to floats.
So type conversions. The operands of a binary operator must have the same type. And if they're not, it'll convert it. If I do this, x is equal to 3 divided by 5.0, it looks at it and it goes, the compiler does all this. It looks at it and it says, are they both of the same type? Binary means it has two operands. No, they're not of the same type. So it has to convert them to a compatible type. Well, if it converted this to an int, it could conceivably lose information. Like if it was 5.1 and you converted that to an int, then it would suddenly be 5. So it's not going to convert it to an int. It's going to promote it. It promotes it to a the better of the two types. And a float, or in this case a double actually, because it doesn't have an f at the end, a double is a much better type. You can convert an int to a double with no data loss. So it's going to convert the 3 to a double. And then it's going to do the math. So that's called type coercion. They're not using that term here. OK. Automatic type casting is the term they're using it in this textbook. So automatic type casting is when but the operands are dissimilar types, and so they have to be converted. If this was a floating point and this is an integer type, the integer would be com converted, cast, promoted to a floating point type. You can force the conversion of it yourself. See, if we had 9 divided by 5 here, that would be integer division. We don't want integer division because 9 divided by 5 is just flat out 1. So we could cast that 9 to a float before doing the division, and then it would work correctly. So automatic type casting, I just described it. But Cares and shorts are converted to ints. There's a hierarchy, right? It just goes up like that. If one's a short and one's an int, the short will get converted to an int. If one's an int and one's a long, the int will get converted to a long. If one's an int and one's a double, the int will get converted to a double, you know, and so on. If you had a short and a double, it would convert the short to a double. This doesn't mention unsigned longs and stuff like that. or explicit typecasting. Remember in Python, your casting looked like this. You call it a conversion function. You don't do that in C. You do it like that. You specify the type, and that turns 9 into a float. And it doesn't only work with literals. This could be a variable, right? Whatever v was would then be converted to a float. So if you convert a float to an int using explicit typecasting, you'll lose the fractional part, right? If it's 3.4 and you force it to be an int, you lose the 0.4. If you convert from a double to a float, well, the float is double wide. Excuse me, the double is double wide. So to go to a float, it would round some digits. And you conceivably have data overflow. If that double will not fit into a float, it will completely mess your data up. And then if you convert a long int to an int, it drops the higher order bits, meaning that, again, you can have data overflow. When a number is just too large to fit into the data type, it gets corrupted. You don't, you don't really get to predict what it's going to be. But that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that you accept the fact that you could lose data. Now, if you're sure that what's in this long is an int, no problem. Go ahead and do it. If you're sure that what's in this double is in a, will fit into a float, hey, no problem. That's cool. What I do, just take pictures of the book? All right, I thought I redid this page. I did. Did I not?
I doubled the length of the PowerPoint. Am I not seeing it in there? Yeah, there it is. No, there it isn't. Apparently I'm getting lost in which PowerPoint I am in. Have I been lecturing over stuff that I already covered in the last chapter? I mean the last lecture. The whole time? Past 30 minutes? Not the past 30 minutes, but... Um, <laughs> Alrighty. I feel like we did this like the second day or something. I got lost in our PowerPoints. That one? Who's um, like, yeah, there's a list of them. I think it's the next one up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just seeing those are getting out. Okay. All right, guys. Sorry. Alright, I just 
if you don't catch me using a PowerPoint that I've already covered, tell me and I'll reward you with donuts the next time. So <laughs> don't let me do that again. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's why my brain got fuzzies because we went off and did that. Okay. I'm sure I gave you something in there that we didn't already know, but in general, uh, okay. I just saved it under a new name. I'm going to have to go back and compare what's between, but refresh your page if you want it. This one's called PowerPoint 4. This looks like a good place to lead back in. So when I demonstrate code, I'm going to prefix the data type with the, the, the variable name with the data type. Is that necessary? No. Do all people agree that that's a good idea? No. But that way, if I'm looking at something and it begins with a lowercase i, I know by gum that it's an int. If it's a long, I could put an L there, but a, an L looks like a one, but I mean, it would just cope with that. I could make it an uppercase L, but generally our variable names aren't supposed to start with uppercase letters. F for float. The book says C. I like CH for character. If it's a string, some people just put an S. I put SZ for zero terminated string because it is a zero terminated string. There's a null at the end of it. If you are going to use global variables, I would recommend marking them. This is kind of the poor man's namespacing, if you know what namespaces are. G underscore indicates that these are global variables. Do you have to do it that way? No, you don't. I'm pretty sure that we have namespaces in uh, C nowadays. If I come up here and try to define a namespace, is it going to let me do that? Namespace my data. And then I put a, ver a global variable in here. Int g1 is equal to 3. Can I get a hold of it down here by saying my data colon colon g1 is equal to 3? Let's find out. The rest of that I had commented out. Don't know what a namespace is. Never mind. Okay. Namespace is a C++ idea where you can give your global variables a specific name and then you can refer to them within that space in that fashion. We don't have that ability. I apologize. I'm going to delete those lines. If you've done C++ programming for years and then you try to go back and fit your feet into C shoes, it can feel a little odd. So our scanf conversions. You call scanf and if you pass it a pointer to an int, you're going to want to read it within percent %d. If you pass in a float uh, the pointer to a floating point, it'll get you a float. Percent %g also gets you a float, but it lets the user type in supporting exponents. And when I say the user type in, you can also read from a file using fscanf, and it follows the same conversion specifiers. Or you can read it from a string using sscanf, and the same format conversions works. Percent %c receives a specific character. Percent %x will allow the receiving of an unsigned hexadecimal number, and percent %lf gets a double. Now, it's kind of odd that the default data type it seems to be indicating nowadays is a double, but yet percent %f just reads in a float. Whatever. 
If you're going to declare your variables as doubles, use percent %LF to read them in. So the above format string would give us the first a seven digit number. We would scan the first seven number digits, excuse me, the first seven characters as a decimal integer. Then it would skip a space. It would skip all the spaces until it hits a character. Then it consumes white space until the first non-white space character is found, consumes that character, and then reads the last of it as a double. So with that in mind, we could type in something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then you could have a whole bunch of spaces, and you could type a letter, and then you could have a double. And this would be stored into the first pointer that you passed in. This would be stored in the second pointer you passed in, a pointer to a character. And then this would be stored into the third. Do you need all that flexibility just to be asking the user to enter their age? No. If you're reading in a line of data from a file, there may be several different components to that data, right? Usually you don't just have one number per line in a file. And I have another syntax down here on the very last slide. Well, the last slide is an assignment. Okay. Called a scanf wildcard. What if you want to ignore a whole bunch of stuff and you just want to get to another goodie that's in the file? So the user is going to be typing a word and followed by a space, followed by a number. And when I say they're going to be typing it in, this is what our input string looks like. And all we want is that 25. Well, what could you do? You could declare an array large enough to hold this string. You could use percent %s to read that string in, followed by a space, followed by you know a percent %d to get that 25 out. Or you can use percent star %s. Percent star %s just says, keep going until you hit the space. And I'm not going to even store it in a pointer. Why would you use that instead of that? Percent %s. Percent %s does the same thing, except you have to store the result in a string, right? You have to do ampersand whatever, you know, if you declare a string array or something like that. You have to pass in a string. But if you do percent star %s, it means ignore that string until it finds a space, and then the next thing after that will be read in. Again, how many times are you going to be ignoring data? I don't know. What if each line of data in the file is preceded by a line number? line number, space, and then a good piece of data. And you want to skip all those line numbers when you're reading them in, and you just want the good piece of data. That's one way to do it. Generally, skipping the string is not a bad idea, because then you don't have to worry about buffer overruns. Buffer overruns are when the data that you're reading in from scanf is longer than the allocated space for the string array that you have declared. So scanf is vulnerable to format string attacks. Great care should be taken to ensure that the formatting string includes limitations for strings and array sizes. In most cases, the input string from the user is arbitrary. You can't determine it before scanf is executed. This means that using percent as placeholders without space, without link specifiers, is inherently insecure, exploitable for buffer overflows. So if we had percent %s here, that means it's going to read in only the first seven numbers. That's a good idea. Percent %s here means, I think I skipped something there when I was typing this in. I did. The rest of this was a string, something like that. So the first seven digits were an int, and then the rest of that string up to the space were string, but this could be arbitrarily long. If you gave it input that was 7,000 characters long and the string array that you were storing it in was not allocated to seven spaces, that would be a real problem. That's just a, an example of using git ch to uh, kind of do the same thing that we were doing with system pause. 
just sit there and wait until the user hits enter and order continue. And Adrian had a cool problem. You were able to fix it by reading it into it as a string, didn't you? Weren't you able to? Yeah. Okay. So what if you had this? Yet, I guess you were reading it directly into a care, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had care is equal to get care to read in that character. And then you did if ch is equal to 7. That was never true. Why is that? Because this is an ASCII value. You could look for it like that. That would work. But just comparing it to a 7 would not work because this is an ASCII byte. This is an integer. The two do not mean the same thing. You could look up what, you know, go to ASCIItable.com and find out what a 7 is, and that's what you would actually be getting. I also think it's weird that in this language that the is digit function doesn't, it takes a character. It doesn't actually take an int, so it's... Right. So what is is digit doing? Is digit is just checking that character. Could you write a function that would accept a string of characters and check them all with this digit with a loop? Yeah, you could do that. But like, it doesn't, I guess in my opinion, it, didn't, it doesn't work the way you would expect it to. So like say if you like, say tell them to enter a number and you store that number in character, it's still not going to be a number because it's the ASCII value right. or whatever that number is. So I, I don't, like that book, there's a problem in there that says use is digit to verify if you've received an N or not, but how do you do that if you don't? <laughs> well, you, you call it, you get your character, you use is digit to make sure that it is an ASCII, but it's not the only way you could do it. If you, let's play with that a little bit. Let's play with that just a little bit. I'm going to go back to my program here. Have I completely messed myself up by having too many of these? No. All right, my, my code is looking kind of lame, so I'm going to put a return zero at the end of it. Make it a little bit better. Before that, I'm going to declare a character. I'm in main now, and I commented out everything else. I'm going to keep getting that warning until I get rid of this foo function, so I'm going to comment that out too. I should not be putting my notes and my program all in the same code. Okay, so I'm going to declare characters. Care ch. Now I'm going to print a message. Not system dot out dot print Print f. Type a digit, then hit enter. Backslash in. Now ch is equal to get ch. Let's print it out. Print f. Percent %x would print out the hexadecimal version of it. Percent %d will print out the decimal value of that byte. Let's see if I've goofed it up. C June eighteen dot C minus O June eighteen dot exe getting an error undefined symbol get CH my mistake I need standard IO and console IO C O N dot IO I have to go back up and add a pound sign include to use the console pound sign include angle brace con io dot h end angle brace save my document I ought to be able to compile it now unless I've made another mistake gcc june 18 dot c minus o eventually you get tired of writing this and you write a script file that will do that over and over for you so you just have to execute it with one command minus o June 18.exe. Cute. Is it in the C type library?
But you were using it. No, I was using scan. scan oh, you were using scan to read it in? Yeah. Well, that's a quick fix. I'm going to do that rather than wrestle with it. I'm going to get rid of that line. And I'm going to do scan F quote percent C to get a single character. End quote, comma, ampersand, ch. Sorry, I hit the wrong key and it took me all over the place. I'm going to delete that code entirely, this code entirely. Get rid of conio.h. At a later point, I want to know, but I'm not going to worry about it now. Okay. How about working now? Up arrow gets me the command. It worked. Dot slash June 18 dot exe. Enter a digit. Hit enter. So if I type 5, it tells me 53. If I type in 0, it's going to tell me 5 less than that, 48. All is digit is doing is it's comparing what you typed in to the ASCII values 48 through 57. That's all it's doing is it's checking that byte. We could write our is digit function ourselves by saying if character greater than equal 48 and character less than 57 would do the same thing. So the problem in the book uses it wrong then, I guess I, I could say? Sounds right. Yeah. Sounds correct to me. I'd, if you tell me the page number, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it. Okay. So anyways, let's do that. Let's print out whether it's a digit or not. Let's use first do is digit. If it's page 78. It's just the end of chapter 3. Okay. If digit ch print f is digit, yes, backslash it. And then let's do parentheses if ch greater than or equal to 48 and two ampersands, ch less than or equal to 57. Is that right? I've already forgotten. What's the highest digit? 57. Yes. Printf ASCII digit. Let's check to see if it's an uppercase letter, meaning it's going to be greater than or equal to 65 and lower than 90. So from 65 to 90 are the uppercase letters. If CH greater than or equal to 65 and CH is less than or equal to 90, print F ASCII uppercase and now I'm going to check for lowercase which starts at 91 and goes out 26 past that 122 if CH is greater than or equal to 91 and 2 percent CH is less than or equal to 122 print F ASCII lowercase. And of course we could write our own functions, is letter, is lower, is upper, to check that stuff. And it doesn't know what is digit is. Oh, you got to include C type. Dot H. Which one? Uh, C type. C type, okay, pound sign include angle brace c type dot h and brace type a digit hit enter how about o well o is not a letter but it did identify it as lowercase and it's ascii value 111
my output's kind of munged because I didn't when I did my printf I did not printf backslash n. So show me the last page, chapter three. Build a number because it, it it compares it to an int, and that's why I, it starts using the random library and wants you to compare it to a random right. Library. But you would have to read it in as a percent d, <laughs> right. right? If you're trying to read it in as a character, you're going to have to convert it to ASCII. Uh, wait, so if you read it in as a integer, but store it in a character, how does that work? No, just store it. Yeah, you could store it in a care. Just do. Well, because if you use int and try to use is digit, it's not going to work because, well, because is digit takes a character and does. <laughs> the character. But you can. You can store an int in a character as long as it's less than uh, 127 or less. <laughs> so if they type in any number between 127, it'll comfortably fit in that character. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why you would store it in an int? That that seems like we're trying to save space. Ooh, I only want to use one byte rather than four. I would just declare it as a as a as a dub as a uh, int. Get rid of that. All right, now back to where we were. Operator precedence: addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Order of precedence, and we're going to hit a bigger precedence table in a minute. But parentheses are done first, and then all your multiplication and division variants are done second, and then addition and subtraction are done third. Now, that doesn't mean that multiplication has a higher precedence than division. It doesn't mean that you go through the expression looking for all the multiplies before you do any single division. Instead, you're just going left to right, and any of these that you find will get done first. Same for addition and subtraction. You don't scan the whole, the whole expression looking for first the additions and then the subtraction. It's just that once you've handled these two categories, the parentheses and the multiplication categories, then you're looking left and right. And whether you find an addition or subtraction as you scan left or right, you do that, or it does that. So as we expect, from other programming languages, you can check for equality with double equals. You can check to see if it's not equal. You can use greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. So, 5 equal equal 5? Yeah, that's true. Is 5 not equal to 5? No, that's false because it is equal to 5. That would be the same as writing this, by the way. And I'd almost rather write that. I don't know. Those mean the same thing. Exclamation point equal means the same thing as that. Okay, but anyways, I'm going to change it back to the way it was. Is 5 greater than 5? No. Is 5 less than 5? No, because they're equal. Is 5 greater than or equal to 5? It sure is. Is 5 less than or equal to 5? It sure is. Because if you use equal, it's inclusive. And if you don't use the equal sign, it's exclusive. So opposites. The opposite of equal is not equal. The opposite of less than is greater than or equal to. Now, that may not be intuitive. You may think that the opposite of less than is greater than. No. The opposite of less than is greater than or equal to because if you do something like this, if 5 is less than x, if you want to include all the other possibilities, you have to do if 5 is greater than or equal to x. Otherwise, you're ignoring the possibility that 5 could equal x. So if statements, if the temperature is greater than 80, turn the AC on. Else, turn the AC off. Good old pseudocode there. The if structure in our language. If structure in this language, unlike Python, requires your Boolean expression to be in parentheses. The braces are optional if you're only executing one line of code, but I'd recommend you use them anyways. And so if this condition evaluates to true, or if at least if it evaluates to non-zero, 
then it does that. Else it comes down here and does that. So if our temperature is greater than 80, it will print AC is on, air conditioning is on, else it'll print air conditioning is off. So we can ask them, ask them for a value and base our response. So AC control unit, type one to turn the AC on, type two to turn the AC off. Enter your selection. We scan in our response into an integer. And if the response is equal, equal to one, we print AC is now on. Otherwise we print AC is now off. So that's just a menu based program. We display a little menu, we let them enter their response. We would probably actually want to loop until they choose to quit. So logical operator truth tables. I'm absolutely sure we covered this. Tell me, did we cover truth tables, right? Yes, we did. Okay, good. The only time and is true is when both of its operands are true. Or the only time it's false are when both of its operands are false. And then not. Not true is false. Not false is true. All right, here's the great big chart of operator precedence. A little bit bigger than our PIMDAS one. So what does all this mean? Post fix. That's stuff after the value. These happen the very first. If you're referring to an array, then that array reference gets evaluated before anything else. That doesn't quite sound right to me, but I'm going to go with it. And then plus plus and a minus minus. Well, no, I don't see minus minus. The, um, is that thing called the lambda or something? The um, fourth thing on the postfix? Like it's using functional programming, I think? Uh, yeah, no, that, that's just a pointer reference. Oh, it's a pointer reference? A, point, uh, a pointer to a member of a structure. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's not doing functional programming. It's just a pointer to a member of a structure. Yeah, it says minus, minus. Yeah. I'm going to have to figure out. I may edit this. To me, eh. But unary, minus like minus if you type three. in minus 3, the minus is treated immediately, you know, to make it negative 3. Tilde... I think that's a bitwise knot. Ampersand means the uh, get the address of, size of, returns the type. And then we get to the arithmetic. Multiplication operators first and then addition operators. Above that is shifting. And then past that you have your Boolean operators, less than, less than or equal to, or your relational operators, greater than, greater than or equal to. You have your equality. Then you have your bitwise, your bitwise operators. You're going to take two bit, two numbers and and them together, or exclusive or them together, or or them together. Now you know what? If you get into a state where you don't know what's going to happen first, just write your lot, your code in multiple states. Right? You don't have to try to figure out which one's going to happen first and sit there puzzling over it. You can use parentheses to force certain things to happen first, and you can break your calculations up in this, into multiple statements if you think that's going to help. And so last but not least, assignment. Those are the last things to happen because the entire expression has to be evolved before it will get assigned into the L value on the left-hand side of the equal sign. Didn't we have another check chart that looked like this? What does that question mark do? That's called a ternary operator. I'll show you that one. Very good question. Very good Let me eyeball this. It actually does come really in handy. I just didn't use that at all. Yeah. Just a quick way to do an if else. Okay, I'm not finding a chart. I thought the last thing we saw before I got disgusted and uh, was another operator precedence chart. Okay, what is the, this is part of the so-called ternary operator. You know, most of these are binary operators. I'm going to shift one bit to the, um, to the left or one bit to the right, or I'm going to compare two values, you know, with less than or greater than, that kind of thing. This one works like this. I'm going to write it long form first. 
if x is equal to 1, or let's do if x is greater than 0, then value is equal to 1, else value is equal to negative 1. That's the long form of it. You could write it like this. Val equals x greater than 0, question mark, 1 colon negative 1. So is this true? If it's true, it gets set to that value. Is this false? It gets set to that value. Could you rewrite it to work it like that? Absolutely, you could. For clarity's sake, I usually at least put the, uh, the Boolean expression there in parentheses. That makes it clear to me. Does that make sense? So, I got you. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. It's almost like you made a function instead of a if statement. Right, right. It's like a function that returns either a 1 or a negative 1. So, if we went back to our code, let's rewrite one of these little bits as a ternary operator. Let's make a variable called lowercase. And we're going to set it to 1 if it is lowercase, or 0 if it's not. I'm just going to store it in an int for clear, for be easy. But int is lower, semicolon, is lower equals parentheses. And then I'm just going to type this expression here. I could even cut and paste it ch greater than or equal to 91 and ch less than or equal to 122. If that's true, question mark, if that's true, I want is lower set to 1 because it is lowercase. Else I want it set to 0. Now, honestly, if we did this, is low in this particular case, is lower is equal to ch greater than or equal to 91, if I just did that expression, they would be the same thing. Because this would evaluate to true, and that evalu evaluates to, to non-zero. And if it was false, it would evaluate to zero. Let's prove whether that's the case or not. I'm going to print both of these values out, one after the other. I should put them in separate variables, but I'm just going to have two print statements is lower one equals percent d backslash n end quote is lower and I'm going to put the same line of code after the second evolution of the statement so if if I'm correct this was a bad expression right just because it could have been duplicate you know rewritten like that and been a little bit more clear I'm going to type a lowercase letter because I really do want it to wind up being hitting one of those. All right. They both did the same thing. The first evaluation is lower 1 was equal to 1. I meant to make that is lower 2, right? Is that they were both equal to 1. So those did the same thing. But I could have changed the values here, right? If it was lowercase, it would be equal to, you know, colon, right, y else colon n. And then later on, I could print the results out. In that case, I probably would have made is lower a character. I'm going to make those changes. I'm going to make this a care. Is lower is going to be a care. I'm going to delete the second comparison. You could just comment it out if you were fond of them. And then I'm going to make this say is lower is equal to percent C. 
And I'm also going to put a slash in in front of it because apparently I was really sloppy about using slash ins in the code above it. So now it'll either print Y or N based on whether it's lowercase or not. I closed GCC. That was moronic. Okay. I mean, Sigwin. All righty. So yeah, that's the ternary operator, and it's kind of nice, and it's kind of makes code hard to read. <laughs> it's one of those things, and uh, it's a neat syntax. It's useful to be able to do an entire if statement in one line like that. Some people do it with um, even more perverted stuff. They actually execute functions and stuff like that in the uh, in the results part of it. I'm not going to try that out. Oh, yes, I am. I can't help it. Is lower. No, 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 no. Let's do this. CH, okay, is CH equal equal to a, a lowercase z? That's going to be our special character. Question mark. And if that's true, we're going to print F Zowie. Backslash in Zowie. colon, printf, nope, or backslash in, no zowie, backslash in, I, and I forgot my backslash in way over here. I know that's perfectly C, valid C++, I don't remember whether that's valid C or not. And so when I run it, if I type in a lowercase z, it prints Zowie. Okay, now to me, that's a ghastly extension of the language. I think that's hideous. I think it ought to be written as an if else. But you can do it like that. It works. If your goal is to try to write as much so it fits on one line as possible, great. <laughs> You could still write that as just one line of code, right? But you'd put, you know, some braces and an else and stuff like that around it. So the if structure, we're pretty clear on. But you can use ands and ors. If temperature is greater than 80 and not AC running equals false, I guess I'd probably change this to. That's, that's assuming that we've declared, you know, a Boolean data type with our pound sign and defs and stuff like that. Let's just do that. If BAC running is equal to zero then turn AC on. So we're using AND. AND requires both of those conditions to be true. If both of those conditions are true, then the if statement executes. Or does about the other way. If the character response is equal to a capital Q or it's equal to a lowercase Q, we would print something. Is digit. We kind of talked about it already. It's the it's a function that, it's treating it like it's a keyword in, uh, no, no it's not. It's a function that checks to see if ch response, you know, if a character is greater than or equal to a certain range of values and less than or equal to, the, you know, in order to determine whether it's an ASCII numeral or not. The switch structure. If you've only done Python programming, you haven't seen switches. What it does is it checks this. And what this is, is it's an integer type or a type, yeah, it's an integer type or an expression that evaluates to an integer. You can't do a switch on a floating point number or a string. 
You can do it on a character, which is what this is demonstrating, or any other kind of int. And so ch response would be evaluated. If they typed in a one, notice that there's single quotes around here because presumably ch is a character, so we're comparing it against an ASCII one. Print you selected sports. If they typed in two, geography. Now there's some missing code there. I forgot a break statement here. That's important, actually. That wasn't intentional. But And then you press three. You selected music. Now these breaks mean that after you've printed that statement out, jump to the end of the switch. Don't execute anything else. Print four, we selected world events, but if none of the above are true, if they typed in anything else other than one through four, we would print invalid category. Now here's the special case here. If they type in two, it's going to print, you selected geography, and then it's gonna skip down. It's going to so-called fall through and also print this. Very rarely do you want fall through. If you do, I would put a comment to that effect. I might even put the break statement here in comments and then explain why I commented out. No, use fall through. Just so that the next person to come along and look at a code didn't go, oh, you idiot. And then they add the break, you know, and then they break your code. And I could give you an example of when fall through is useful, but I'm going to skip that for now. So that's the way switch works. So, okay, in that switch statement, if you, you scan F to get one of those and they enter a one it'll actually be like the uh, character one instead of if we character. read it in as a character if we use percent C in our scanf to get a character in then we will have an ASCII value of a one okay. but if we read it in as an integer then we would not be comparing it to these quotes gotcha. so if we use percent D we would just be removing those in order to get it to work. We're going to stop real soon, but generating random numbers. The random number generator generates a number between one and the maximum value of a short, of a signed short. And so to turn it into a useful number, you modulus it by the upper bound of the number. If I want my upper number to be 10, then I would modulate it by 10, and then I would add one to it, because modulus would only give you numbers zero through nine. Remainders of zero through nine, you tack one on it to get one through 10. And you go, but what if I wanted zero to 10? Well, you just have to figure out the range, modulus it by that and modify it however you want. If I wanted a number between one and 20, because I was rolling a 20-sided die, I would modulate it by 20. If I wanted a six-sided die, I would do modulus six plus one there. So the increment and the decrement operators. A lot of people, a lot of books will tell you to put the plus plus in front of the variable rather than after because it executes more quickly. And so since we're writing in C, we presumably care about speed. So that's actually true. May as well do that. I wonder if smart compilers now try to fix that. But what happens is, is if you do plus plus I, it only evaluates the address of I one time. Whereas if you do I++, for some reason, the uh, underlying assembler evaluates the address of I twice. So plus plus I is faster than I++. They mean almost the same thing. If you use plus plus in a variable, it adds one to that variable. If you use minus minus in a variable, it subtracts one from it. I am so used to typing I++ that I don't remember to type plus plus I instead. Maybe in my code examples in here, I will start doing that. We're going to need to end really soon, but we're so close to the end. All right, so what is the difference between plus plus I and I plus plus? If the plus plus precedes the variable, it's the very first thing that gets done in the expression. If we looked up at the precedence chart, we'd probably figure that out. It'd probably show a unary plus plus up at the top, near the top of the uh, precedence. If you do I plus plus, it's the very last thing that happens in the expression. The rest of the expression is evaluated and then and only then. Now, if you're just adding um, one to it and that's the only line of code in it, it's fine. It's not going to make a difference. But what if you do this? And this will be the last thing we do. int w. w is equal to 3. Print f. 
quote percent D backslash N and pass in plus plus W. Then reset it back to 3 and print off the same thing. Percent D backslash N comma W plus plus. When it prints, the first thing we're going to see is 4. Why? Because the plus plus is the very first thing that happens before it evaluates the, the, uh, the entire statement. Here, it's the last thing that happens. So this is going to print out 3. Now, after both of those statements are done, it's going to equal 4 regardless. So if I put this in again, print percent, well, yeah, just take it on faith. After the statement executes, it's equal to 4. Now, W equals 4. Same thing here. Now W equals 4. I need to make a quiz for this since this book did not come with quizzes. I will post a quiz by Thursday so that we can test our, our, our knowledge. I'm not sure that we're going to have enough tucked away yet to do an exam next week, which is maybe what I had plotted. I'll have to check our, our schedule. Okay, so I'm going to run that code, make sure that it works the way that I expect, and then we're going to be done for today. All right, you see that plus plus W evaluated to 4 because the plus plus occurred first. The prefix increment is the very first thing that happens in a statement, and this one printed out 3, but then it incremented W. Now, does it usually matter? Not if it's on a statement by its own or if it's just part of a for loop. It's when you include it as part of something else. And C programmers tend to like to include their decrements and their increments inside of other pieces of code. So you'll see that in other C code, so just be aware. The consequence is that this is the very first thing that happens and this is the very last thing that happens. So like in a for loop, what makes it like, I guess not evaluate how that one did because like if you well if you do this for w is equal to zero keep running while w is less than four three w plus plus it behaves the same way as if you wrote plus plus w just because this is a statement all by itself now if you try to be sneaky and you do that right if you do w is equal to zero while w++ is less than 4, that's going to behave differently than if you wrote w is equal to 0 while plus plus w is less than 4. I do have to have something here. You're right. No, no, you're allowed to use any condition that you want here. No, no, no. I mean, like, you, you just put W equals zero, and then you're putting a while, like, under it. Like, doesn't the while have to go first? No, I'm, I'm initializing W, and then I have a while loop, and then I should be printing something. Oh, okay. I thought you wanted, like, the condition to make it zero. I Yeah, I just hadn't typed the whole thing, so it wasn't clear. I'm going to remove those braces. They're not necessary if you only have one line of code. All righty. So lastly, but not leastly, so it printed out 1, 2, 3, 4, and then it printed out 1, 2, 3. it actually did have different behavior based on whether we did W plus plus or plus plus W. On, in both cases, W wound up being one by the time it got here, but it was the basis of the comparison. Here the comparison was done and then it incremented it. Here it was incremented first and then the comparison was done. So like if, um if w equals 3, then the second one wouldn't execute at all? Right. If once w is equal to 3, 
then by the time it gets back to this line, it's going to bump it up to 4, and 4, four is no longer going to be less than 4. That's why it counted from 1 to 4 here, but it only counted from 1 to 3 here. Gotcha. But I'd use a while loop anyways, and in that case, its behavior would be very understandable, and it wouldn't matter whether we use plus plus w or w plus plus. All right, let's make a drop box for what we've done today. Ah, uh, homework. Got to have homework. Last page of our PowerPoint. Write a program that generates two random numbers between 1 and 10. Call them R1 and R2. Display those numbers. Then have it print the bitwise AND and the bitwise OR of R1 and R2. Then have it print one of the following messages. R1 equals R2. R1 is less than R2. R1 is greater than R2. I would expect that this is going to be a fairly short assignment, but if you get stuck, ask me about it. Compound assignment operators. Regardless of which language you've taken before, you probably know what these mean. A plus equals B means A equals A plus B. A minus equals B means A equals A minus B. A star equals A means A equals A times A. Just squares it. Okay. Dropbox. All right, I declare chapter two done. Read it to fill in any gaps that I may have glossed over. If you've taken my classes before, you're used to my scores being between one and 100. But since D2L defaults to them being 10, I've just given up on making them 1 to 100, and they're now 1 to 10. But they're the same, right? If you get 10 out of 10, that's 100%. Not evaluated any differently. When you, on that assignment, when you ask for uh, it being a bit, the bitwise and or, or, does that mean you want like the 1 or 0? Right. How do you print the bitwise? The bitwise of two numbers is like this. So all you're going to do is um, printf whatever, and you're going to do r1 ampersand r2. That's a bitwise and. Okay. And then a bitwise or is r1 single bar r2. Gotcha. Different than a logical and and an or. Dropbox should be there. You refresh it. You'll see ch F. Yep, people have already uploaded into it. All righty. I will see you all Wednesday.